About a year ago, I spoke on a panel alongside Google and NVIDIA about AI, along with some other experts. And at that stage, I was sure that AI is only going to really affect the low hanging fruit. More rudimentary jobs in visual effects, such as roto or camera tracking or motion capture, things like that. Then DALI 2 and Stable Diffusion came out. And still being upbeat, I thought, well, you know, AI is just going to help us work more efficiently with our art. And we're all just looking at it wrong. And then DALI and Stable Diffusion came out and still being upbeat, about a month ago I thought, well, AI is just going to help us work more efficiently with our art. And we're all just looking at it wrong. But in the past couple of weeks, I've been shocked at how much AI is changing the landscape. So let's dive in. So as an artist with 27 years experience in the visual effects industry, I've been doing computer graphics for 30 years, creating a lot of digital art on computer. And I never expected to see this kind of automation that's happening today with AI. From creating art in any style to generating video and 3D models, even just using a text prompt saying, give me a army tank as a 3D model and having it generated for you. All of this is made possible through GPT and GANs. So those technologies are learning at a lightning fast speed and already being used in deep fakes, mid journey, stable diffusion, DALI and other applications as well. But what does that mean for artists? Because ultimately a lot of us are really kind of wondering like, where do we stand with all this? And I've seen this firsthand before where new technology can be intimidating and let's say with traditional animators feeling threatened because of the emergence of 3D animation. Computer graphics comes along and they feel like, oh my God, I'm going to be out of a job now. The computer's going to do all the work for us. And while artificial intelligence might be able to automate certain tasks, it's still up to us as artists to be able to use them as an extension of our abilities and be able to interpret the client's ultimate vision. So let's not be afraid about the future of art and how AI can disrupt the visual effects industry, but rather embrace it and become early adopters of this exciting new technology. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about what has happened in the last few weeks and really my take on all of this. Because despite what others and myself predicted, AI did the opposite of what I expected or what anyone really expected. AI is now able to create art in any style of any artist, as well as create video, create 3D models. All of this is being driven by GPT, which I've been following for the last, let's say, three years. It's about 2019 when it first conceptually was mentioned and whether or not OpenAI was ever going to release it because of the dangers it could have on the world. And at the time, this is purely article driven. It was that you could just generate infinite articles and they could be misinformation. No one could ever tell the difference. And that was something that could be very much weaponized and whether or not we actually want to do that. So at the time, this is something for me that was very exciting, was the ability to just automatically create articles and emails and all this other stuff. That is something that was really exciting and intriguing to observe, I guess. But I never really thought that that would lead to where we are right now. So none of this was previously possible because we couldn't really ever talk to computers before. We can program computers. So assembly, which is where we talk to computer hardware, is how we're able to communicate a command for it to do. And then we have like C++ and all these other programming languages, which allow it to kind of translate in, in an easier fashion than assembly into assembly and communicate in ones and zeros to the computer what to do. Then we get Python and things like that, which are kind of a, a wrapper on top of a wrapper. But the whole idea is that we might be able to create these simplified languages to be able to do really complex tasks. But ultimately, all we're doing is having to communicate in a really dumb rudimentary way. And then comes along GPT, which allowed us to be able to start talking the way that we would as a human being. It's a natural language processing model. It's able to understand and interpret what we tell it. And so suddenly we could actually describe to it and feed it more information, have it learn everything and say, I want you to go and do this. And it would be able to understand what we mean and be able to go and tell itself what to do. And already that alone changes the playing field because as I mentioned before with assembly and all these really crude ways of communicating, that's something where in the future, that's probably how things will work is that we don't have Python wrapped around C++ wrapped around assembly doing all the stuff. We'll just be able to talk to an NLP, a natural language processor and be able to say to it, Hey, go do this thing. And it will go write its own code to be able to communicate to the hardware. 
without needing DirectX and C++ and all this other stuff to kind of layer on top of it to be able to function properly. So forget all the technical jargon, it just means that now, for the first time ever, we're able to communicate directly to a piece of software, an artificial intelligence, which is able to understand what we're saying somewhat. So GPT allows us to be able to communicate to the AI and for the AI to understand what we're talking about. It's also able to read the internet, essentially, and be able to understand what it's reading and interpret that into its own data model, its own brain, and be able to do something with that. So all of that is possible and all of that changes everything. It's able to read the internet or the data it's been trained on, and it's able to then take a verbal action or question or whatever we give it and understand what we're saying to it and understand the descriptions of, let's say, I want you to go write a program to do this, this, and this. But at the same time, like maybe we write it all clumsily, it still understands it. Or we describe, make me an image that looks like this. And the more that we're descriptive, the more that we're able to give her the nuance that it needs to be able to take that and give us exactly what we want back. That to me is such a major disruption to everything that we've ever experienced. And that's why I'm excited. Now, GPT, like I said, is an NLP, is able to understand what we're saying to it. But combined with GANs, it's able to learn pretty much anything at a lightning fast speed. So I don't intend to make this a big technical AI talk. I actually have recorded an hour long talk breaking down everything about AI. And that's based on the Google NVIDIA panel that I was on uh, a year ago. And I'll be releasing that soon. But for the time being, just to talk a little bit about GANs. GANs are general adversarial networks. So what they're going to be doing is having two AIs. And they're kind of pitted against each other. And let's say that the goal of the AI would be to create a photoreal image of Tom Cruise. So that's what the AI is pitted to do. It's like, go out, make me the most realistic rendering of Tom Cruise you can. But the other AI is looking at the same training data, but its goal is basically to pick every single fake AI generated image that comes out. So each time it creates it, it's going to say, yeah, that just doesn't look right. Not that it necessarily is fake, it just doesn't look accurate. So it's going to go back again, it's going to have another attempt at it. But each time they're learning from each other. There's weights and biases. There's a lot under the hood uh, in this neural network that's able to have a better understanding of how to do it better. And it's learning and adapting every single time. And so these iterations are in the hundreds of thousands. So it continues to learn through repetition, through learning from some mistakes. And that's something that I wish a lot of us would do as well. I would go on a big rant about this, but I love the idea that AI never adapts the whole fear of failure. It's willing to try, it's willing to fail because it knows that that's the process to getting better. It's going to put in its 10,000 hours. It's exactly what we need to do. Mind you, the 10,000 hour rule with AI is probably more like a couple of days. Again, this is the whole fascinating point of like where we're at with everything is that AI is able to do things at a lightning fast speed. But again, a general adversarial network means that we can have two AIs working together to make it get to a point where eventually it will be able to draw that image of Tom Cruise and it's going to say, all right, that looks good enough because we've told it kind of like how lenient it should be. In other words, do it this many times or get it this close to what we're willing to accept as being real. And then it's willing to step away and say, all right, now this artist is good enough to draw Tom Cruise. Uh, I approve of this model. So that's how again essentially it works. Now, the interesting thing is that what that's doing with drawing Tom Cruise's face, let's say, that's how deep fakes work. And also Stable Diffusion, Midjourney, Dolly, they all rely on similar technology. So these ones instead you use something which is more of a diffusion model instead, rather than just relying on two GANs and trying to learn to replicate it. It's looking at lots and lots and lots of images and building out essentially an image of random noise. And what it does then is it's able to revise areas of the image and make it better and more accurate over time until it reaches a satisfactory level and then it stops. So very similar in a lot of ways. It starts out with a noise model and starts to revise it until it gets to where it needs to be. And this is something that's it's based on learning all these different labels of training data that it's been fed off the internet from ArtStation or stock libraries or wherever else as well. And it's also based on how many attempts or other factors that you give it to. 
So the source material that you're feeding it is training data, which is used to learn what it needs to. It needs to learn all these different styles. It's trained on millions and billions of different examples of training data. And we're now getting to a point where we're talking about trillions of parameters as well. Uh, we've got GPT-4, which is meant to be coming out pretty soon. And that's rumored to have, I think it's 100 trillion training parameters, which is absolutely insane. So you can call these tokens or parameters, there's plenty of other terms, but essentially they're all different training models that are being grown to be bigger and bigger over time. And it's very expensive to do this. It's like $10 million and a, a chunk of time to go and train this stuff up. But it's absolutely insane to see the results that we're getting if you've noticed this stuff online, which I'm sure you have. So imagine with some of these bigger brains, like what they're going to be able to do compared to before, because it isn't one times better or two times better. It's like 5,000 times better with every single innovation. So like I said, GPT-4 from OpenAI is rumored to have 100 trillion parameters. Whereas let's say GPT-Neo, which is a whole other training model, that one has about 2.7 billion parameters. So there's different ones that are different sizes. And right now, as it currently stands, GPT-4 is likely to have the biggest by far than any other brain or training model. So all that aside, that's really nice. But what does that mean for artists? So as mentioned, most experts thought that it would really affect just more basic repetitive tasks. Roto, camera tracking, mocap, performance capture, because... If you think of performance capture being, you know, the camera on someone's face, you know, that might really help as reference for some of the keyframes, some different weight targets or do morph targets for everything. But ultimately, you're not really going to be able to capture the nuances that uh, an AI can do because it will analyze every single pixel in the previous pixel. and It'll start to understand where they're heading, all the different subtleties, but it's able to label them all and understand what that facial expression is, all these different things, and bit by bit is building up an understanding of that person's performance or whatever it's capturing. It's able to do that at such a minute level that a human eye can't do, let alone a human clicking a mouse can't really translate that performance across as accurately. Usually we're working on the phonemes for creases in the mouth and the lips. We're trying to get the curl right on the lips or nostrils to flare, the wrinkles to happen. And we do that through a combination of morph targets we do it through a combination of weighted bones or clusters around the face as well. And the thing is that with performance capture, it's literally mapping out the entire face, all the subtleties. Um, I haven't mentioned this yet, but I have Bell's palsy at the moment. This is from my last job being such a stressful, chaotic, unstable environment that um, I half my face has been paralyzed for the last year. And because of that, even now when I'm speaking, I can tell the muscles in my face are a lot more tighter on the right side than they are on, on my left side. This is my left, if we're flipping the screen here. So I say all this because, again, just as I'm describing performance capture, unless someone communicated like, hey, like, you know, for some reason, Alan, you know, his eyebrow doesn't go as high up here, it's because my face has been paralyzed for several months. And part of that, though, is, as I'm mentioning, is that with neural networks, you're able to look at and track every single pixel over time and what it's doing and how they all work together and be able to translate that information across into the performance on the character. So you can retarget animation from one performance, one other person, to a completely different person or performance or whatever on a different 3D model. So all of this is really exciting. But this is kind of stuff that is predictable in the sense it's like, okay, yeah, it makes sense that, you know, we're able to track all this and build out training models on, on character deep fakes all that is is amazing innovations but we're kind of used to that it isn't such a radical thing as it would be to say go make some original art that's never been created ever before by famous artist mark simonetti or someone like that and being able to then see it do it is just phenomenal and having talked with mark simonetti he's someone who's actually like this is really cool he just wishes now that there were thousands of images out there saying created by Mark Simonetti when he never painted them himself. And it's just other people using his style. So these are the things that are really disrupting the industry because suddenly now we're at a point where what is original? And on top of that, is everybody now an artist? So these are the things that are coming up. And it's, it's a very threatening and scary time, I think, for a lot of artists because it's like, well, 
am I going to have a job pretty soon? It was already really difficult to, to get work before. And now what's going to happen? Like, where are we going to be a year from now? So previously I saw this as people panicking over innovative improvement. Okay. I didn't think of it as being as disruptive as it currently is, but in the past couple of weeks, it's been extremely disruptive and it's kind of scary in a lot of ways too. So to talk about the history first, because I think it's important to differentiate between people panicking or just panicking for the sake of panicking. So I've seen this all before. I've seen it when lighting artists felt threatened because global illumination came out and they thought, well, no one's going to hire a lighting artist to light a shot anymore because now you just hit the GI button and when global illumination is turned on, then suddenly the scene is lit, everything is great and you know you can pack up and go home. I have yet to hire an artist to click GI on and call it a day. Obviously, there's still a requirement for people to light shots to make it feel a certain way, to control how light is hitting everything. It's the same way a photographer doesn't just walk outside and say, well, everything's lit and I'm just going to take a photo. You're going to paint with light. You're trying to get a certain feel. You're trying to get a certain style. You're trying to accentuate the shoulders by putting a light behind you. You know, all these different things because that is the style that you're going for. And the more that you have intuitive tools, the more that allows you to be able to do things easier than you could before. But it always meant that there was an artist behind the tools, being able to execute on everything they're doing. But lighting artists were afraid of GI, the same way that effects artists were afraid of fluids. I feel like in the beginning when I was testing out some very early alpha software, some of the leading fluid software out there these days, that was something that, you know, I was playing around with. I got a knack for it. I was really blown away by it. I've always been addicted to how to push things to a certain level. So when new technology came along, I got more excited about it. It was something that made me think like, wow, like now I can do this and I can do that. I'm excited by the possibilities. But some of the people who were around me, they were quite the opposite. They didn't understand it. It was a whole new thing that they got to learn. And because of that, it meant that they were now really intimidated. They were really unsure about whether or not they're going to have a job because this fluids can just do it all naturally. You hit a button and it just does it. So all the technical know-how that they needed to learn up to try and fake things with particles and to get a certain feel and certain vibe to their, their work, all wouldn't be needed anymore. And I've yet to see fluids eradicate effects artists. It just meant that effects artists now had more control with fluids. In other words, the more that they could innovate and adopt the new tools, the more that all the opportunities open up for them. So I've seen mass innovation over my career, over the past 30 years of doing computer art, and the tech has just made the tools, like I said, more intuitive. Even recently, Photoshop came out with content aware. And content aware didn't mean that, oh my god, now it's going to take out jobs because Photoshop can do all the painting for us. All it meant was you now have a tool that's able to do the bits that you don't want to do. It wasn't Photoshop is going to take out jobs. It was merely taking the tedious task of rubber stamping out all these different areas that we didn't want to use anymore, we wanted to cover up, and it's able to do that in a speedy process. So that way it has made life easier. It didn't mean like, oh my God, content aware has changed everything and we're all going to be out of jobs now because Photoshop can rubber stamp everything for us. But this is ultimately what most improvements are. So it might sound silly me mentioning content aware, but it is an AI driven solution for Photoshop that's doing something that we could see as a threat, but we don't because we see it as doing something that we never wanted to do in the first place. So it becomes an innovation. It becomes an improvement over anything else. So these are innovations that allow us to do more, more easily overall. But now we're talking about stable diffusion and Dolly and Midjourney, GPT chat, all of this stuff, I guess, is something else. So when Dolly 2 was first announced, I was blown away. I had been following two minute papers, shout out if you're watching, by the way, and I was blown away by this new thing because all the new AI and neural network solutions that are coming out, the papers being published, it's a really exciting time. Not the core two minute papers, but what a time to be alive. It honestly is a really exciting time. And Dolly was something that, to me, I was just blown away. It was something that I was like, wow, I can't wait to play around with this. I was really excited. And then Mid Journey and then Stable Diffusion, and they kept getting better and better 
So what was interesting was that I started to think about this and I started thinking that the way things are going with concept artists, maybe it's going to be like motion capture to animators, where animators who work, a lot of studios do a lot of mocap, all they're doing is hand fixing all day long. And maybe that's what the concept artists are going to be doing is there's an amazing illustration. Let me just go fix the gimpy hands that Mid Journey managed to put in there because somehow it thought six frail fingers would be a good solution for a hand. So fortunately, it didn't really go that route, but it is something interesting to kind of think about is that even at its infancy, what is possible now is so much different to anything that's ever been possible before. And then GPT chat or chat GPT uh, came out, which is a model somewhere in the middle of GPT-3 and GPT-4. And honestly, I didn't see that coming at all. I've written a couple of chat bots based on GPT in the past. And they're really interesting, even if you're doing fine tuning, which is additional training um, outside of the training model. So that way I could teach it all of Alan McKay's podcasts and then be able to have it spit out new podcast episodes. Like, that'd be interesting. So there's a lot that I've been doing on the programming side. I've written a lot of software. I've been writing deep fake software. I've been doing a lot of engineering on the side for the last couple of years, and it's been fun messing with this stuff. But even creating a GPT-3 chatbot was interesting, but it was nothing amazing. It was great at summarizing information. It's good for copywriting, writing articles and marketing, etc. But ultimately, that's about it. And I'm not alone. Most experts all deemed the innovation we're witnessing right now is extremely far off. It wasn't something that's going to happen in the next couple of weeks or months or even the next couple of years. So to think that stable diffusion and mid-journey and all of these other AI models have come out in the past year and have completely done what we thought was a decade away or more or impossible in general. Not only that, but if you think about it, like Stable Diffusion is only a couple of months old. I was chatting with Bill Cusick, the creative director for Stable Diffusion over Stability AI not that long ago. And in fact, just over the weekend, we're nerding out about GPT chat and it's just amazing to see like in its infancy what is possible let alone where things are going to be like when they hit the one year mark i mean that company hasn't been around that long stable diffusion hasn't been around very long so where is it going to be in the future a year from now five years from now nobody can tell because ai is just iterating that quickly so about two months ago now i think i was in portugal at the thu event alongside famous artists and speakers like uh, mark simonetti Alex Alvarez from Noman, Ian Spriggs, Meet Myers, a couple other really phenomenal artists. And even during the event, there was a bunch of major AI announcements happening, like Whisper AI and other training models. And what was interesting is AI was definitely the big subject at the event. Like all of us were talking about it. And there was a panel uh, that uh, Chris Nichols from CG Garage or Chaos, um, he was the panel speaker curator, panelist, curator, we'll say curator, the MC uh, of the event. And it was really fun just to kind of see everyone's takes on it all. Now, a lot of artists were passionate about the subject of AI replacing them, to say the least, especially using their own portfolios against them, because this is some of the best artists in the world all grouped together in one space, all talking about everything they're doing and being excited and I just thought it was a really phenomenal time. But people were getting angry about the idea that AI is going to replace them. They're saying, like, we've got to band together. Now is the time. We have to do this now or never. And I guess maybe I'm more of a passive person, but I'm always just kind of like, it's inevitable. There's nothing we can do. Not even worth arguing about. So this was just something that, to me, I just thought was a bit moot. What are you going to do? Shut down all the billion dollar tech companies that are looking into this? There's going to be more that pop up. And this is why ethics play such a big role. That's why I like about Stability AI or Stable Diffusion is they definitely care a lot about the ethics behind all this and what they're doing. They don't just put out this powerful technology and expect that it's not going to have backlash. And there's a lot of responsibility that comes with doing it with care. I can fully understand why a lot of us would be afraid of all this new technology when it does threaten everything we do. And it is a brave new world. It's scary to see what took decades to master, such as drawing photorealistic illustrations or simulations, compositing, all the things that we put our life into to get to this level 
that no one else can do what we do. And it's now being created by anybody with just a couple of keystrokes. They can replicate what we're doing, but it's unique. It's new. It's not photo bashing a bunch of stuff together. Instead, it's actually learned through observing everything out there. Now it's able to create, having understood all that, it's able to create new original content. And this is something that a lot of people don't really understand. They think, oh, it's just getting an arm from here and a leg from here. No, it's drawing it from scratch. It's observed, it's learned, it's studied, just like we all do in art school. And now it's the best student you could ever see. It can do anything. So I mentioned 30 years ago, I first got into computer art. And at the time, traditional animators felt threatened by the computer, especially because at the time, everybody just saw it as the computer is doing all the work. And this is something that we all had to fight for. Everybody just saw it as the computer making the art. And it wasn't us. It wasn't talent. It wasn't putting in late hours. It's just the computer just does it. And that was something that made a lot of us feel threatened. It also made a lot of us feel that we're misunderstood. People just saw it as there being zero talent or creativity that were really going into making the computer generated images. And I guess I've been around the block enough times to identify patterns of fear over innovation when they do actually surface. But of course, I don't see this being nearly as comparable to anything ever done before. It's doing this at a whole different level. But the patterns do exist. We are naturally afraid of innovation, of change. We feel threatened a lot of the time. And that's why it's scary, especially how quickly it happens overall. No longer can we say, I can't wait to see what this thing's going to be able to do in five years from now. It simply comes down to where the hell are all these things going to be five months from now? Nobody can predict what's going to happen. But in my experience, those who are early adopters always win. Those who are driven by fear with the pitchforks wanting to burn it all down are just holding onto the inevitable. And the future is the future. We need to adapt with the times or die. The CEO of Disney, I think he just got reinstated as CEO again, but previously he was CEO for a long tenure. And Bob Iger would always live by the slogan of adapt or die. And I've always said accommodare, adapt, because it's so critical that we adapt. We roll with the punches. We don't get caught up in our one thing. Because early in my career, I'd see that everyone have their one thing they were good at. And for me, that's why I got really aggressive at putting out tutorials and trainings because I wanted to share everything I knew so that way others wouldn't have to go through the struggles that I go through. It also meant that if I share everything I do, I don't have that one trick that I'm going to cling on to. It's going to force me to have to go and make new innovations, new solutions, come up with new ways to do things because otherwise I'm going to go stale and die by the side. So that was always my thing. I would always share the information that I was, I was coming up with, the, the late nights I spent trying to figure out how to make fire, how to do smoke, how to composite something a certain way. All the different things that I was coming up with, I would share so that we would force me to continue to adapt, to innovate and to continue to grow and never become stale. And this is something that I've always impressed on everyone I meet is to adapt or die to continue to innovate because if we go stale, if we get too comfortable, that's when we start to get lazy. We start to fall to the wayside. We become irrelevant. So it's important to always sharpen the edge of our sword and always sharpen our mind to make sure that we are learning and thinking and growing and pushing ourselves and staying outside of our comfort zone. Doing all these things are critical for us to continue to evolve and to continue to be at the forefront of everything and be ready for whatever challenges come down the line. All of this is really critical, and I challenge you to do the same. So my whole take is this. I don't think the world is drastically going to flop on its back. I think we're going to start to see a lot of noise, and everything's going to be amplified. This means there's more of everything, the same way that we've seen in the past on other genres as well. A good example to me would be like when Fiverr came out. Uh, Fiverr was a website where you spent $5 to get any service you wanted on the website. And it was pretty fun at the time because... It meant that you could say, hey, build me a web page for five bucks or build me a logo for five bucks. And most of the time it was utter crap. But the thing is, it was five bucks. So you could afford to lose it. And that meant that a lot of the time we would just throw things out there. I need a web page made. I need a logo made. I need a company vision statement made. I need a business plan made. There's 30 bucks. I've got my whole company done. Awesome. And that's how a lot of people were doing things. 
Fiverr now has evolved. There's like Fiverr Elite and all this other stuff, and it's it's not the same thing anymore. But at the time, it meant there's a lot of crap going on the internet. There's like web pages, ad banners, social media posts, everything in more quantity because it was cheaper and easier to do ultimately. But you were getting five dollars level of quality with everything. So if you think about that, it's kind of like GeoCities back in the '90s on the internet. It was just like really ugly web pages everywhere. It's the same thing with stock footage where beforehand you might have like a really original pieces where someone might film an interview and they go out and film all this B-roll and they really put a lot of thought into it. And now instead you just go on and download a bunch of B-roll and you see it a mile away and you can detect it a mile away. It's like, oh yeah, that's all ugly B-roll. just doesn't fit well with everything else. It stands out, but it was cheap and that's what someone did and managed to get that point across. So when GPT-2 came out, for copywriting, that meant that you didn't necessarily need to write these crazy long sales pages or really innovative ads that required a lot of thinking. You could just have this language model that's read the internet, be able to write something for you and it'd be a good starting point. So everything is changing, but it still a lot of time means I'm still going to hire a copywriter to do copywriting if I'm not good at copywriting. I might be able to use AI to generate it, but do I know that it's good? And I'm pretty sure that a good copywriter is probably going to be able to use those tools a lot more innovatively, if that's a word, uh, in a lot more of an innovative way that would allow them to do more with it and be more impressive. So maybe being on a command, the high fees that they did beforehand, that could go away, but ultimately, are they going to get replaced? Who knows? But that was a bit of an issue is the fact that suddenly now everyone can be a copywriter. And this is what I mean by the fact that I do think that a lot of things are going to become a lot more noisier. We're going to see a lot more stable diffusion and mid-journey images being generated everywhere. We're going to see AI art everywhere. And we're going to be able to see it a mile away, at least right now. Over time, things will change and maybe eventually we won't be able to tell. But in the beginning, it just means that we're going to be dialing up the noise. Everything is going to be louder. We're going to see more crap all over the internet. And then there's going to be good original content as well. And sadly, it will going to get lost in the shuffle a little bit, but there's still going to be a need for good quality stuff. And that's going to happen too for 3D models, for video. We're going to see more of that. And stock footage is definitely having a place there. I'm sure a lot of people are already trying to sell and post, make their quick buck while they can, like how NFTs were a big thing for a little while. Being able to generate artwork to sell to stock companies and things like that. Now, one thing to keep in mind too is that there is already AI out there, kind of like a GAN, where you have one AI and then the adversarial other AI is out there to detect it. Well, that's exactly what is being worked on for deep fakes for a lot of things. So that way we can easily detect, well, that was computer generated by AI. It wasn't done by an original artist. And on top of that, Companies like Stability AI, Stable Diffusion, um, they were mentioning to me, which I'm not sure if it's out yet, but I know that they're working on it right now, is a way to watermark images and other things as well. So that way, under the hood, there'll be a invisible marker inside the image. It'll be able to say, yeah, I was generated by Stable Diffusion. And this means that it'll be easily able to look at the image and say, okay, that's AI generated. So that means that we can eradicate any images from ArtStation or somewhere like that that were AI generated if we wanted to. Something that I was thinking about recently was what if you put into that same kind of metadata every single artist that it was trained on and they all get a couple of cents per image. You know, this could be a whole new paying model that we could look at doing where we're able to digitally trace the origins of everyone who influenced that piece of work. And kind of like iTunes and other you know platforms out there, there'd be ways then to pay all these people for their contributions. That way, in a way, everyone involved gets paid. And that could be a really exciting way to look at things too, the way that Spotify and a lot of the other music streaming platforms all work, where they're playing music all the time, but each play, you know, it's ticking some numbers um, that, you know, eventually equate to monetization by the original artist. So... These are things that I think about a lot in terms of not, we got to stop this stuff, but well, how do we work with it? 
And to me, this is exciting. I'm I'm excited to see where this is all headed. Um, at the same time, it it is scary to think that you know I might have never need a lawyer again or to consult with a doctor because I could just talk to my computer and it could do it all for me. It's an interesting time, but it's also interesting to see what that will lead to in terms of innovation. But this brings me back to my first point, adapt or die. So yes, the person who doesn't know how to make art, they be able to make art now. Awesome. And because of that, maybe they won't need to hire an artist anymore. And they can just feel good that they got a base image for free. They didn't really need to do much other than go to Alexica and copy paste a prompt and change a few things and spit out a mid-journey image. Awesome. But this is the same way that you might see stock images being used on a website instead of original images because people started to feel like, well, I can save money. I don't need to hire a photographer anymore. I can just go to this website, get that stock image. I don't need the artwork anymore. I can get this one over here, go to Fiverr for that. And suddenly people were already doing similar things. It's just now we're universally pointing the finger at AI rather than all of these other services. To me, those people, in other words, those people who are looking for cheap solutions, they're the same people that I would see back in the 90s who would be on IRC back then and I'd be like, what are you up to? And they're like, oh, I'm just in Photoshop applying filters until I see something I like. In other words, they're trying to create artwork using filters until they magically get something that they're like, whoa, I'm such a good artist. Whereas somebody else is putting intent behind the artwork and they have a vision, they're able to paint it, they're able to create it, they're able to compose it, but they're not just randomly getting a solution that they're like, oh, fumbled onto this one, this is cool. And that's kind of how I see those people is if they're always going to be there. It doesn't mean that they're ever really a paying client. Um, the ones that are at least going to pay for your living are going to be the ones who are going to need real work. That's going to be special from you, directed by you. doesn't matter if you use AI or not. You're delivering a solution to that person. So the person who is the artist, this is the chance to have all the power at your fingertips. I think this is important because this is a chance to be the art director to the AI. So my job as a visual effects supervisor is purely to direct, let's say, 20 or 30 artists on a certain vision and continue to give feedback and iterate on that until I get the right result. This is so close to how we talk to Midjourney and Stable Diffusion. We're simply art directing them to make certain art that we want or that our client ultimately wants. The traditional artist is still going to paint the way that they paint. The 3D artist is still going to work the way that they work. And we use AI as a tool the same way that we might have previously used brush sets or photo bashing or stock images or filters or overlays, etc. We're always going to make our work. We just now do it a lot more intuitively. And as a visual effects supervisor, it's not my vision that I'm trying to push the artist to do. It's the director's vision. In other words, the client's vision they're entrusting to me to go and get made. I'm using all these people and they're using the solutions that they need as well. So you gotta think about it this way. If there were an avatar again that came out that James Cameron could just type in the movie that he wanted and with the AI it's able to make it for him, do you think that he would do that? Do you think he'd fire the whole team and sit back with his laptop and say, I'm gonna make Avatar 1 million today and type them all in, make sure I get the zeros right, hit enter, there it is. The Smurfs in the jungle and on the water, it's beautiful, that's all I need to do. That to me just doesn't seem like something that anyone would really want to do. And I promise you that Cameron would have no interest in sitting at a computer and telling it what he wants. First of all, he can't yell at a computer, so it is that. But there are people who are hired to do just that role, which is to execute on the director's vision. The director's job is to direct, and they'll direct others go do their job of executing on the direction that they're given. And those people will talk to their teams of people who are all using AI and other technology to make it their lives easier. And now they can make their work, but much more intuitively than they could before. The artist might leverage those tools, but the client isn't the one pushing all the buttons. They're the ones wanting to have all the work made. They hire a company, they hire people to use these tools to make the art, to deliver the service, their vision to them. Okay, so hopefully that made some sense, but that's ultimately what we're trying to do. And that doesn't mean that everything from 20 years from now isn't going to be different because 20 years ago, everything was different to how it is now. Things are always going to change, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're all eradicated from the planet. 
but things are starting to move and they're starting to move much, much faster. But likely our process as artists will change. It won't go away, but we're just likely to have super tools to create our own work that we didn't have before. And yes, there will be people who think they can just go to AI and have it all generate everything for free. But like I said, they're not our clients. They're not the people that we take seriously anyway. And as always, there's going to be a bunch of us who when a client says, well, I just get AI to do it all for me. We're going to be the ones snickering in the corner saying, okay, cool. I'll see you in two weeks. And like clockwork, they'll come back saying, I didn't really quite get what I wanted. I was wondering, are you still available to work? Because there's always been those cheap solutions. There's always been, well, I'll go hire a junior artist to do it. I'll go get some stock footage off the internet. But if you're good at what you do, people are going to hire you for those services. If you're using AI, people are going to hire you to use your unique ability, your language, your way to describe things. The ideas that you have in your head that you have a knack for being able to manifest into words and then continue to handhold the computer until it gets it to the point where it is what you originally envisioned. Or being able to take that and finish it off in Photoshop and get it to the point of where you like it. Or take the 3D models and be able to then revise them, refine them, and get them to that level of quality that you wanted just much, much quicker than you could have before. That's the thing is these clients, all the people who want or expect all the shortcuts, the hacks, that's already been around in one shape or form before. And the thing is that those clients... They don't know how to talk to the AI. They don't know how to control it. And they don't know what they want ultimately. They never do. Just like right now, creatives have their place in the process. And if anything, those who know how to leverage that power will just have even more technology behind their creative skills to utilize. And the artist's job is really to interpret what the client wants and turn it into their vision. So who knows 20 years from now how things will be, but I do hope most of us can embrace technology and embrace the innovation and realize how now is the time to get in front of this technology and be early adopters rather than thinking that overnight all of our jobs are instantly going to go away. So it's important to look at all of this through the right lens and it's impossible to predict exactly how AI will impact the art industry or any industry, but it's clear that those who adapt to new technology will be the ones who thrive. There will likely be an influx of mediocre art created by those who are inexperienced and those using AI as a tool, but true artists will be the ones who will use AI to enhance their work rather than replacing their skills. Look, the demand for skilled artists is never going to disappear. People are always going to need artists to create artwork and use their interpretation of their skills and everything else in between. The thing is that we still want to embrace innovation and not fear the changes that technology brings. Now, What are your thoughts? I would love to hear your opinion. I know it's easy to lean into the fear. And remember, I've talked about this in the past, the difference between being inspired by something or being intimidated by something. So this is your chance to be inspired, to look at new opportunities and see all this as a new version of Photoshop or a new version of your latest 3D software and all these new features and capabilities that are going to allow you to do what you're going to do. This is exciting to be able to look at all that and, and think, wow, Now I could do this and I could do that. And what if I did these things together rather than looking at it like, oh my God, we're all doomed. So rather than being intimidated by new features that are going to make life easier for everybody else. So rise up to the challenge, look for new opportunities. And you know that there will always be a space for creators in this world. It's just important that as the technology evolves, you evolve as well. Thanks for watching. I would love to hear your opinion. Are we all doomed? Also, what are you using AI for in your own artwork? And I'd love to hear any other new innovations or exciting AI tools that you have your eyes on now or you're looking out for in the future as it comes down the pipe. Oh, before I go, finally, I know you hear this all the time, but if you could leave a like and subscribe to the channel. I try to make videos daily for this channel as well as my weekly podcast, which we have nearly 400 episodes of the podcast right now. I do all of this in my spare time outside of my day job as a visual effects supervisor as well. I try to help artists succeed in their career and land their dream jobs. So if you've ever been interested in learning the business side of art that everybody seems to be so secretive about, be sure to subscribe to the channel so that we can get more exclusive daily content. As well as courses and interviews with industry leaders, I recently had William Cusick, the creative director for Stable Diffusion, on the podcast to talk about everything AI related, as well as Rob Brennell, the head of Industrial Light and Magic, Tim Miller, the director of Deadpool, and so much more. Thanks for watching. If you like this topic, I also have included a couple of other recommended videos on AI right on my screen right here. 
Stay tuned for the next video I'll post later this week. Bye for now.